Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hey everyone, I just want to start off with the universal greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the Archery Ascension podcast. Today we have a very special guest, a dear friend of mine, Ahmed Karat from Maidan Archery. Ahmed is a founder of Maidan Archery and we've had many amazing conversations over the last year or so. And I'm excited to share this with you today. So without further ado, I'll just let him in through Zoom, and we will get started. Alaikum salam. It was Ahmed. muted, that's why. Fair enough, fair enough. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. that's good. That's good. I like what I can see in the background. Yeah, I thought I'd mix it up. <laughs> the room. I just had some guests, I had my tea here. Nice. I'd bring my laptop here instead of being in the office. Yeah. Um, we did, I just did I did a recording with um, a brother in Jordan, um, and, he, and he practices jiu-jitsu and and tai, I think a form of tai chi, and mm. um, he came down to the archery range when he was visiting Australia in January. Um, but I noticed even in his background he had the he had the the clubs. He did. Yeah, yeah. I didn't get to ask him about it, but inshallah, next time, next time we have him on, um, we, we can talk about that more, inshallah. Mashallah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Very well. I know um, we've had a few conversations before. We've had a few conversations before, but I thought this would be a good opportunity um, hey, that. to connect. That's it. Alhamdulillah. So for, for everyone that's listening, we have, um, I call him Ustad Ahmed. We have Ahmed Karat, or Ami Karat from Maidan Archery. Um, and Ami is the founder of, of Maidan Archery. And I know in some of your previous podcasts, you talk about how you had a compound archery background. And, um, and then you, how you transitioned into traditional archery. And I was wondering, just to start off, if you can tell us all a little bit about that. And your background and where you come from. Yeah, yeah totally, inshallah. Bismillah. So, I guess, uh, I think you have a compound background as well, don't you? That's right. That's right. Yeah. I do. I do. Uh, similarly to yourself, I um, started out as a compound shooter. So, in 2004 or five, um, I was obviously studying Arabic uh, and my teacher who was teaching me at the time um, suggested I, you know, I take up archery. Um, obviously he praised it. I, I had no clue back then. Yeah. And then I got into compound. Um, and then after about 10 years of shooting compound, hunting, uh, even to an extent competing in 3D, um, I came across the book Arab Archery. So I bought it on Amazon, and after reading that book, I th I, my whole perspective on archery has completely shifted because um, that showed me that archery isn't just a sport. Mm. It's a martial art. It's a martial discipline. It's, a, it's something much greater than, than um, just a pastime and a, and a feel-good sport even you know, even to an extent where it, it makes it changes uh, your character. So the way that when I read that book, I I, I saw things in it that just uh, resonated with me deeply because in that book, spoken you know, the author mentioned about Madahib in archery. He mentioned things like arkan, mm -hmm. you know, things that only a scholarly person of his time would. Uh, quickly realized that this guy was not a simple person. He wasn't, he wasn't just a guy writing about, you know, he wasn't just a seasoned soldier. He was actually somebody really well educated. Yeah. The way that he formed his thoughts and, and everything in that book really inspired me to inquire further, which I did. Um, and I ended up studying uh, in Turkey and then consequently I, my, the, the change in me, happened in Turkey when I went to see Murat Ozveri and Okçular Vakfi 
And th those, those were turning points for me because that's when I realized this is so much more. When I came back, because, because of my compound background, I helped a lot of people into archery just as a mate, you know, just mm -hmm. as a guy who's, who's a bloke who knows how to shoot compound, how to put them apart, put them back together, um, helping brothers out to get into, you know, compound and shooting and hunting. Uh, when I got back, that same following naturally kind of followed me in with my journey, kind of. Yeah. All along. the boys, all the brothers and the families or your friends that were with you and, yeah, um, in the compound, when you were just compound shooting, hunting, going out on the farm, when you started taking it more seriously and you went on your journey. Exactly. So they kind of followed almost, you know, like it's a little bit, like a tribe, you know, when when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would, uh, you know, and when, when a leader would embrace Islam, then the followers would embrace, you know, straight away. Like, yeah. that's how it works. Yeah. So I felt, I felt my conversion was, yeah, it definitely affected the rest of the guys who were around me. Um, I don't know a single one that remained on compound. <laughs> well, where, where are your compound boys now? <laughs> compounds uh, but like I said they're just collecting dust yeah uh, so yes because I did it on my farm at the time yeah I uh, it so coincided that my I lost my farm due to uh, road upgrade I didn't have a place to shoot anymore having visited a number of clubs I didn't feel like they resonated the values that we had as a group Mm. And hence, you know, out of that, organically, it was completely organic that Maidan was formed. Yeah. So when I, you know, when I was, what inspired me to call it Maidan is for the reason Okshar Rakfi is situated in Ok Maidan, in Istanbul. Ok Maidan. So I said Maidan. I think it resonated really well, and we said, you know, Maidan is. You know, field it's it's a place where people are all equal yeah there's no prejudice there's no judgment there's no, no judgment there mm -hmm. and you're just in your uh, your um you know somebody who's capable you know your capability your, your merit That's and uh, yeah so we had to you know archery is in there you know archery is to empty the mind that's what we tried to sort of incorporate in that i made an archery club you know, the club is the family, you know, the, the community, and then uh, Australia is, you know, to try and, trying to benefit the land that you're in, trying to be like, you know, the real movement that should be like rain. Wherever you fall, you benefit. So you try to benefit the community. That's right. And we started with a, with a Boston Community Centre, and they accepted us. It was a great um, service to us. You know, they... They hosted us. We grew for, I think we lasted there about two years and we grew and um, so we had to get another bigger place and not just bigger but somewhere that would accommodate horses because yeah. our first international guest was Mihai Cosme and that's how we can, you know, I think that's how you and I met. That's he right, exactly. For his clinic. Um, and then... Uh, because of the horses, um, we couldn't stay there. We had to go to another farm. So to find somewhere more suitable. Exactly. And we have. We were also, again, fortunate from the Boston community. They were able to facilitate us. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. Boston Masjid uh, has a farm that's just five minutes down the road from our previous club, where we still can go and shoot if we wanted to. It just so happened that, you know, this turned out a little bit further away, but actually turned out better um, yeah. in many ways. Um, yeah, so um, now we're based there and the horses are not far away. So mm. Kingsfield and uh, various other places where other students keep their, their horses are pretty close by. As a matter of fact, you could probably ride to the club and back. You don't need to float. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. That's, that's really, really cool. 
Yeah. So, that's really cool. Uh, we've, we've started very, very humble beginnings. You know, I, I pretty much, I was trying to learn on the way, on the go, because we were growing organically and there was, we found that there's a gap in the community. Mm. My, uh, you know, my growth prompted the, run, the ones around me to grow. Yeah. Uh, I didn't take it seriously, but when you realize that, look, this is potentially something that you can do as a sadaqa jariya, mm. then, you know, you take a different approach to it. And, That's uh, right. Yeah, so these days, uh, you know, in, in the beginning, you're measured, you know, you've got this many followers or you've got that or this. Right now, I measure myself more on how many teachers I make than how many students. How many people are part of the club. Yeah, like I, I need to make teachers of archery. I don't need to just make followers and people who are just, you know, a fan base. Yeah. That's not the point. The point is... Yeah making as many teachers as you can to teach as many other people as as you can because there's no way that only one person can do such a massive task because let's face it we're trying to impact the face of a australian archery mm, that's right that's, that's the immediate you know impact that we're gonna probably see and we've yeah. seen that in the, in the short time that uh we've been around yeah like at the Bathurst Festival? Bathurst is only one of them, but what I yeah. really love, Aussies are now starting to make horn bows, which was never, like, it's an unfathomable, like, you would never see that before. Yeah. They'd laugh at the idea, and now you see them uh, talking about thumb rings and what fits best. Oh, actually, I'm not a thumb ring shooter, but for all the thumb ring lovers out there, here's a, here's something. <laughs> here's something. Here's something for you. And uh, you see the inclusion, you see the, the beautiful side of, a, of Australiana. Mm. You see that's not often talked about and even less seen in yep. community circles. So that, that's, that's really what Ian Fenton said. He goes, you guys are going to change the lands landscape yep. because we're, hard, we're new. A lot of us are young mm. and we've, a, a fresh approach to archery, and I think you know, hopefully, you know, a, a breath of a breath of, a, a breath of fresh air to the um, to our local community, but also on the on on the global scale, you know, we try to help where we can. We try to support brothers like you know Jihad Shams, uh, all the masters, Murat Osveri, Mihai Kosme. You name all of them. You know, we ultimately we're just um, sitting on their shoulders, as Justin Ma said. Uh, you know, we're standing on gi uh, shoulders of giants. That's it. You know, nothing else. So um, yeah, it's all about that community support. You know, like like we came down with you guys and continually support each other wherever and whenever we can, because ultimately this. Is that's awesome, and I know we had um we had a really, really amazing trip together to Newcastle, or uh, a bit further than Newcastle, I think. Um, yep. Yeah. We bought, we bought the boys some Melbourne, and I don't know if we should mention who we stayed with, just because I know he he's he's more of a low key guy. Um, no, he's fun. He's a honey, though. Yeah. You're right. right. He's, he's a honey and a half, but I think um. But that was so amazing to see and to see the process that went behind and like even with him, like he's this like seventy year old Aussie he's bloke. 75. Seventy-five year old <laughs> Aussie bloke. And when he started talking about the Turkish bow and the efficiency in the limbs, like his eyes lit up like a child. Um, for the audience, uh, Alan Camp. So Alan Camp. For for the people who don't know Alan Camp. Anyone who's worth their salt in traditional archery Australia will know that name. Mm. He's, he's a bit of a, if I was to compare him to Adam Kasparovich, I'd compare him to that of Australia. He doesn't yeah. make both sell, he makes them to, to give and to experiment. That's right. It's just a passion. True lover down to the core of traditional archery and archery in general. That's right. A guy with um, love of archery. Uh, and it was it was such an amazing time at his property. 
and seeing his process and seeing the drive. And I think um, we're going to get the boys on on here to talk about it because I think, um, especially Isam, he took away a lot. He yes. Took away a lot. So he called me the other day to check on me. I felt really bad because um, I didn't call him. And uh, he asked us, when, uh, inshallah, when, when we're ready to go for, on a fox hunt with him. Oh, nice. I have to, yeah, I need to talk to you about that as well. Um, yeah. It was very, like I said, you know, we, we do, you know, we, what our question is when we go see someone, we take them a gift. Right? And mm. he was really by by the je- gesture and, and all of that. Mm. So uh, he felt he'd, li- he'd like to, you know, take everyone out on a, yeah. on a nice hunt. Fair enough. Well, t- talking about hunting, maybe let's segue into that. Because I know you, you also like you have a hunting background as well, but I also know that a lot of people that listen, when they hear hunting, it's a bit of a, well, red flag type situation, and there's a lot mm-hmm. of um, misunderstandings about what hunting is and what's involved, and like how could you kill an innocent deer? How could you shoot such a cute fox? Well, you see. I truly believe that people who hunt as a way of life are animal lovers and conservationists. I don't think uh, that people can argue against that. Now, if you are a hardcore uh, vegan activist Mm -hmm. trying to, you know, say that, you know, we are just raping and killing animals, you know, for the for our own good there's no arguing with people like that okay so you've got extremes on on both ends you've got the vegans who are trying to ever make everybody else vegan and then you've got the you know the typical sort of sport hunters that usually you know come from countries like america that just go and hunt for the sport of it um which is you know something that we don't do as muslims you know, we, we hunt to, to harvest, we hunt to eat and to use the animal ethically. We do hunt also to cull. There's no doubt that, you know, even the, even the first narration of archery was in case of uh, crows attacking crop and then the archer shooting the crow and keeping it away. So it's, it's a matter of survival. So people who are saying you can't cull animals and this and that, Obviously, I've never lived on a farm and don't understand the, the hardships of, of living off the land. Mm. And then, again, people who eat meat and say that we're harsh, then they're the, they're the people who, who are supporting an industry that is really, really brutal in, in their way of harvesting this meat. So they, they can't really, um, yeah, they, they, they don't have a leg to stand on, to be honest. So we, we're not in, in either extreme. We're not an extreme that we used to eat meat and, and we make, we're trying to make everybody like ourselves, mm-hmm. nor are we the sort of people that are hypocrites uh, and only hunt for game and eat meat that is, uh, we don't support this meat industry that is, um, or we try not to support this meat industry that is not tayyib, you know, as they say. Uh, in our terminology, that is not ethical. Yeah. This is our stance. So people, you will have always disagree- disagreement, you know, and often people are judged by who disagrees with them as well. You know? So I don't mind having disagreements with people that are like that. Fair enough. No, I think that's... Um that's amazing. I know there was a book I was reading called The Mindful Carnival. Uh, maybe mm. I can send that to you, but it was it, the author. I can't, I, I think his name is pronounced Tom Cerulli. He talks about his journey going from just like average Joe to becoming a vegetarian, to becoming a vegan, to then becoming a hunter. Is this the Danish guy? No, he's American. Oh. He's American. Um, it's a really good, really good book. But like one of the things he says, for example, is even on the vegan, organic, free, 
organic, you know, organic strawberry pesticide free strawberry farm in America, he uses as an example, they still need to hire in shooters to come and shoot the deer there because how else are they going to protect the, the, the strawberries or the vegan organic crops? Do you know what I mean? Um, there was a beautiful video I watched, if you don't mind me sharing here. Um, we, don't have to, we don't have to play the video, but I'll just share the screen just if people want to look it up in their own time. It's, can you see this? How, how Wolves Change Rivers by Sustainable Human. And they talk about how um, they remove wolves from Yellowstone National Park in the US and then they reintroduced them. And when the wolves started hunting deer, it actually changed the biodiversity of the land there. And then like beavers started coming and all these things happened and the rivers started changing how they like, like their flow and like the ecosystem just flourished. Well, that's permaculture. That's right. That's, that's right. permaculture. Jeff Horton, Sheikh Hassan Sotur, he talk about all the time. We are part of the environment. That's Although right. I've seen that uh, Yellowstone story, yeah. but then again, I saw somebody trying to debunk it and say it wasn't true. Mm. So I don't know how credible that that particular one is. I don't know. Because I, re- I was fascinated by it and I started following it and then, I don't know, it's so online. That I guess really like being in Australia, we're seeing the same impact but, but more in a negative sense, like with the feral animals. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Talk about cats or pigs. Oh my God. Cats, pigs, foxes, right? Because Australia has um, the highest, like, or the most unique biodiversity anywhere in the world. And with the introduction of these species and with them running free, like we lose out. And it reminds me of um, Surah Al Rahman when Allah talks about the whole world was set into balance, right? And part of our job as humans is to maintain and look after that balance, right? And like every Aboriginal society, like you can't say they don't love animals, like any native society. But you see, like, from Australia to the Americas to Africa to Asia, that all these people have hunting ingrained in their culture. Because, like you said, it's not about the sport. There's a deep spirituality behind it. Correct. Correct. I think um, this, the very same people whose ancestors bought the very pests that are here are coming in and lecturing people again. Um, I think just they need to lay off a little bit and... Uh, yeah, just lay off and look in, inwardly a little bit because world. I, I think if anything, we need to go back to nature and not try and reinvent the wheel. Mm. I, I, and I, the, the biggest key to everything, I think, is greed and hunger. I think that the human beings have become so greedy and so hungry and, that, and because of that, fundamentally, we've, we've changed our environment around us. Just like if we were to become less greedy and we were to follow the scholars of old, that our environment would change to the better. Mm-hmm. So everything boils down to um, the, the sickness of, of the nefs and the heart. And if that's fixed and that's addressed, I think the environment would follow because the humans would, would change and their consumerism wouldn't be as vast and, and, and as, as great and they would actually care as you, as we've seen many, I'm sure you you know better, many examples of the past where, you know, even great civilizations like the Ottomans had had a certain care for animals and their environment, where where they used to you know spray seeds, for example, spray seeds during winter for the birds to have food, and, or or even incorporate, you know little pools of, of rainwater for, for birds to, to eat and many others. For example, the camel that would roam the market, you know, after be, becoming deaf in battle, yeah. she would roam the market, the camel would roam the market and eat the fruit as they like. The sultan would pay uh, for all damages. Where no, nobody could touch that camel because it was, it was given the title of Ghazi, you know. So, um, yeah, they, they had a profound and an innate love for animals. Yet, 
they you know they they use those very animals and they mm -hmm. ate from them and, but they never they I, I don't think the key here is that they weren't as wasteful as we that's are right. today that's right and i guess part of that is because they understood the process and they appreciated that that like where the animal has come from and where it's going yes yeah well if you believe in in a in a in a greater purpose i think that it sets you up in a positive way that's right but then you don't believe in anything and you think you're in this world to just eat and sleep and reproduce mm. well <laughs> you know you know you will see the effects like we're seeing today that where people don't think about their future generations they don't have an outlook they, all they care about is the immediate self-gratifying pleasures and and they don't care about any ramifications because they believe that once they die there's nothing after that which is a very dangerous belief system for both environment um and and people yeah. wow that's amazing i was just subhanallah it's true and it's it's amazing how our conversation of archery has come this way yeah well, uh, yeah true a lot of people are talking about these issues these are yeah. these are you know relevant and, and current issues that a lot of people are facing right now yeah and, uh, i think and a lot of people are capitalizing on them in a i think it's good that people are talking about them but yeah. and they're capitalizing yeah. on them but the you have to know you have to go to the core of these issues and these issues the core of these issues isn't nature or the environment the core of these issues is us as human beings and changing how and who we are to become better for our surroundings so that our surroundings can come be better for us because people talk about environment but nobody wants to change right. everybody That's wants right. to change the environment but when it comes to yeah okay i got to cut my food in half and i got to waste less and i got to recycle and i got to do this and i got to do that and think about organic food oh my it's getting hard because you got to pay extra money and you got to work you got to plant you got to you know it's not easy so i got to be away from my social media i can't go out i can't do this and i can't do that and a lot of people talk say oh it was good in the times you know i wish i had a farm and i mm. could live off the land but they don't understand what it's like because it's hard work the work that goes into it and i think um that leads to one of the other things i wanted to talk to you about not just life related but also like because we had this interesting conversation last time when i was with you about being in your body and your mind at the same time yeah, I learned that from you cuz um, subhanallah you said it so eloquently. Uh, you said something that's cuz you or he or sh the, the kids or something they live in the body and they, we were we were doing a cost right what about that went off in my head I was like yes. That was exact. So that that's the point. I learned I learned more from you guys than you guys ever learned from me. It's just maybe you don't realize it but subhanallah you guys are amazing and just your company. Mashallah, I'm very fortunate. We're, 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 we're mirrors for each other. Yeah. We're mirrors for each other. I am you. I am not me. I am you. <laughs> hey, Allah. Let's see, see. I learned Just... that directly from you. La ilaha illallah. No, you, uh, you heard it from Kashi. So you heard it from the one who taught me. I wouldn't oh, say no. that because you told me the night before. You told me the night before. When we were practicing together in the dark. Hey, mashallah. <sighs> this is, subhanAllah, this is, um, yeah, like I said, that on, on this journey, and the other thing you said, uh, which struck a note with me, and, and I found that very, you know, um, it, it left an impression on me, was when you went to Saudi Arabia. And I not long ago mentioned it, that, um, the thing about horses before your life before horses and your life after right yeah so 
You mentioned that story. That was that was you know it leaves a, it leaves a lasting impression because one thing is the one who is experiencing this sweetness and then somebody comes and puts it into the words. Those words have a very strong effect. Yeah. It's like, you know, certain people, when they listen to the Quran, they, there's no feeling. Yeah. When they listen to a poem, hardly something comes. But others, you see them, they, you see sweat, you see um, like physical athar, like you, you see a physical impact. That's how much it, it affects them. You know, like it ha completely different. But that's because they are in tune, they, they live. And when those words strike them, they subhanAllah. Yeah. Like, like when you told me, mashallah, like when, when the horse master told you, he asked you a question, how was your life before horses? And how is it after? And he goes, every person he asked, what did he say? Every person he asked, that it's better. It's better. Can can you tell us a little bit about your horse your horse journey? Your journey. Well, I, I was fortunate enough to buy a horse that ended up being my teacher. Mm -hmm. I um, when I bought her, everybody was kind of. Ag not against, but everybody was worried. Everybody, you know, she's a, she was a, what, what some people would, would, would call a trouble horse. Mm. And, um, but I, I had the time to stick with her and work with her. And I think I, I learned as well, a lot of people, I, I had a great support structure. I had some amazing teachers. And um, it, it's just about being learning how to be in tune with the horse, and that helps you facilitate. Kind of, it becomes a vessel for you becoming more in tune with yourself, and then following on to being coming more in tune with your kids and your family, and it's on and on. Um, I bought, so I've had her for a year and um, you couldn't catch her in the beginning and you know she was hard work but then now alhamdulillah you know uh, we've been through one injury we've been through you know we, we ride I've taken the bit out of her mouth alhamdulillah and um, yeah we're, we're forming that bond that you should have with your horse so I, I have a very long way to go, so I'm not I'm no horse master, or I'm no I'm not that experienced with horses, and I'm still very much a student and very much learning. So, but the more the most I've learned is listening to your horse, and then your horse takes care of the rest. The horse teaches you. I feel that if you can be in tune and just listen, that the, the horse will teach you. Yeah, but this, yeah, is, this, this is Joyce you're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. She's, uh, we, yeah, so we, it's, yeah, it's been an interesting journey. Because everybody was saying you won't be able to shoot an arrow from her yep. uh, within the next three years. Man. And we, we managed to do it in less than six months. That's amazing. So, and we're talking about a, a novice. I'm I'm a complete noob and, and a novice and, and you know a layman when it comes to horses. I was just I'm trying to find that photo, that beautiful photo of you and Joycey. Um, oh, the yeah with with that one. I just want to share it with people so they can actually see. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll I'll share it. We'll edit this and I will put it up here so people can see what we're talking Inshallah. about. Yes, we will. Inshallah. So, uh, yeah, alhamdulillah. It's, it's, it's been a great, uh, you know, very humbling and very, it's been a great journey. Now, we've, um, so our, our aim is to um, emulate 
futua mm. as, as you as you guys you know we're all part of the same movement which is yeah. essentially you know trying to emulate futua and trying to emulate the four sunnah arts or four sunnah disciplines as some others call it to um to have archery riding wrestling, and swimming and running swimming and running is in one bucket and alhamdulillah one of the one of my teachers said look if if you want to check if you are on the right path if your heart's in the right place if you're doing things for the right reasons then check if things happen for you easily or if they just kind of come in front of you because initially i tried to do this through wrestling you know i've got an an mma background and and uh, i did brazilian jiu jitsu and it wasn't cool yeah you know when, when there was no hype about it and i remember back in the day i ended up long story short i ended up breaking my knee and that journey was cut short because i wanted to go to brazil because you couldn't get your black belt at the time in australia you had to your best bet was to just travel abroad for six to 12 months and just you know after you got your blue or purple belt here you just go overseas and get it done but um it didn't happen for me i broke my knee allah ta'ala shifted me in this direction mm-hmm. and um i ended up in archery but now alhamdulillah we've got now wrestling with zurhan and pahlivani arts yeah. uh we're exploring that we're exploring the horses we've got archery and now we're exploring the 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 swimming, the swimming. so it's it's a real it's a real journey isn't it and it just totally. it is and it, be, it really becomes way of life where you plan your holidays you plan your life around these things rather than just doing them spontaneously yeah and um because it's not whole- a pastime no 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 it's it, it is really work and um I'm hoping that this rubs off on my kids. Mm. Uh, I'm just mindful that I want I want them to love it more than I do and I but I don't want to be forceful in that. Mm. So I try to for example with my son he loves um he loves the archery piece. He's good with animals but with my daughter she loves the horses and she's good with archery so you you will see all the kids are a little bit different right. when it That's comes right. to um their preferred sunna discipline so in an in an early age i try to make it as natural or as organic as i can where they i let them kind of find their flow it's going to be interesting once they cross into that age gap where they need more discipline yeah to see how they fare in their chosen or or in the various disciplines that it's going to be because essentially my kids will be dummies or kind of guinea pigs yeah for the for the kids that are coming now that's we've got it's born into the club born into this you know that's right alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. You, mashallah had a daughter and uh, pure blood both yeah. mother and Our, our archers now, you know, and the part of Ascension, part of, uh, and even, you know, in Melbourne, Ascension in Sydney made that, you know, you part of our family and we're part of yours. But, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they flourish and bo- blossom. And we might end up having inter-club marriages. And then yeah. And the, the bride's going to come in on the horses. Hey, voila, hey, voila. Oh, I love it. Ask for them with the bows, and they can. Uh, That's it. Nice um, like that comic, like that comic strip that um, Armand. That was amazing. <laughs> he found it. I was, I was amazed. Mashallah. It's his background. He, he knows. Yeah. Ah. Ah. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. He's a, like I said. You have a very solid and very nice group of people. And inshallah, this continues that what you do is the right thing to do. And this continues to be a magnet for, for good people, um, inshallah. And for good deeds, of course, and accepting from our Rabbah. 
I mean, oh, that's amazing. I was just, I was just reflecting when you're talking about your children because one of the things I know the ulama of Furusiya or the ulama, this classic ulama used to say about horsemanship is that if you know how to rear a horse, you know how to raise a child. Yeah. Um, and it was just interesting because like my background is mental health and youth mental health specifically. Mm. And my journey into horses, like the way the top horse men and horse women work with horses is very similar to how we as therapists are trained to engage young people. Right? Yes. But just more on that, because I know another thing, I'm not too familiar with this, but another thing that we spoke about was the temperaments. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and how you might notice with your children even the temperaments and the affinity to the different disciplines or arts. You know, what we, it's funny you mention it. Like before I said, sometimes there's people who, who think about these things. Yeah. Somebody comes and says something that just uh, to the normal people in the in the room they would think why is he you know going off his head when he <laughs> hears this person but they just don't know what's going on because of the longing and the and the suffering and the sweetness at the same time that we're experiencing in this journey because we didn't have teachers Omar mm -hmm. like we have teachers, but we you you literally have to pieces of the puzzle and you have to find it's it's really frustrating and when somebody comes and gives you a puzzle and says it, it belongs here you're like yes it's <laughs> so the classic one was the the number four you know mm. i always wanted to know why is the number four so important you know obviously you know as muslims as as people you've got the four seasons as muslims we've got the four madhabs mm. as um as business people, we've got the four quarters. Um, yeah. Number four yeah. is significant all around us. And um, in every way we go. In Zurhana, everything is to, done to the four count. In, in archery, it's natural four count. Again, you know, yeah. your heart is four chambers. Mm -hmm. Then when this guy from the UK, um, Muhammad Ishaq, came over and starts talking about these four temperaments, because I did a podcast with Boys, Boys in the Cave, and they impressed me. So I started listening. I, I heard about this guy. I went, this fits mm -hmm. right into the philosophy of Furusia. You know, and everything is connected. Like when I, when I sat down to him and I said, the number four is important. And he, he grabbed me and he goes, I like you. <laughs> and I, I looked at him and I said, I like you too. And we understood each other. But yeah. I said, always made of four things like you are made of four things and he, he goes give me a pen and he, he starts writing and i said okay the boy has got the whole you know the wood the horn the sinew and the glue and the glue ended up being the water and the horn the fire and the sinew the wind and the and the wood the earth you know element you know he realized and also at the same time in archery we encounter similar things like the the four uh rashidun you know when you talk about them they're also the all the different elements and the temperaments and then how when you in archery when you're making a bow you should resemble the traits of imam uh, imam ali anh, and when you're making an arrow you should re resemble the traits of imam umar and i think when i did islam i mentioned you know you, you're going to be arrow maker and yeah. he clicked in, on it. Like if you look at um, Sammy, you know, he's got holistic knowledge. Mashallah, the guy, when he looks at something, he looks at from from a whole thing. He doesn't yeah. just go into one, one area. So like Imam Ali and all the different temperaments. So when you are, when you're talking about the number four, when I spoke to brother is, uh, is, uh, is ha, uh, Muhammad Ishaq about the four temperaments, Everything just fit. And then we went into the Sunnah arts. Of course, there's four mm -hmm. because there's archery, ride, riding, swimming, uh, archery, riding, wrestling, and then swimming and running. I, I thought it was five, but swimming and running is one. It's not mm -hmm. two. Why? Because 
In Arabia, in the Sahara, you don't have water to swim, so you run. Correct? But if you have somewhere on the coast or you have rivers, you swim. You swim. So it's, it's what's available. Yeah. Our deen is easy. Um, and they, they require the same skill sets. And they all, they all focus on breathing. They all focus on letting go. And, and uh, relaxation. You know, slowing things down. Alhamdulillah. So everything fit in. And when Muhammad Ishaq came, you know, it was such an honor and, and a blessing that I was able to uh, learn from him. So all, people all around you, you're learning all the time. But you just have to listen. You just have to be in tune. And I think going back to that, your horse teaches you that, to be observant. And notice. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever get this experience when you're with your horses, just like the time goes? All the time. I just missed my futur today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I missed my futur. But you know what? I had my daughter with me and, but it's okay. It's okay. A couple of minutes happens. Um, but all the time. Horses have a way with, with, with slowing things down. And then you just time, you lose it. That's right. But, you know, the Prophet said, it doesn't make you feel bad. Because the Prophet said, um, training your horse is never a waste of time. That's right. SubhanAllah. <laughs>